So my name is Gurney Hunt. I uh, work at IBM Research with a group of people, um, some of whom have already spoken, like Mimi, um, used to work with Dave. Dave moved on to perhaps greener pastures at GE and others that you've seen. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, a product that's about to come out in IBM. Um, it's, IBM is obviously changing because we're talking about things that you can't buy before you can buy them, but not telling you when you'll be able to buy them. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's close enough that we're going to talk about it. This work was done as part of, is derived from work that we did under a contract to the uh, US and Canadian governments. That's what all that fancy words on the left says that our contract requires us to put on all derived publications, of which this is one. Um, so I'm only going to speak from my view, although it represents fairly closely what's going on. If you have any, any, I'll answer any question I can or tell you I can't answer it. So basically, I'm going to go over these, these four things. I'm going to give you an introduction to protected execution facility. I'm going to give you an overview of the architecture. I'm going to give you some lower level details, and then I'll give you a quick summary. So the, the team that's working on this is IBM Research, IBM Cognitive Systems, otherwise known as Power, and the Linux Technology Center. Some of the people from the Linux Technology Center who have contributed to this. Our objective is to deliver um, this technology on, for open power and power systems. And all the software and firmware associated with it is, is either already open sourced or will be open sourced. So the basic idea is that there's a there's a, there's, it's our, we're, we have a model that's similar to the model that AMD introduced, if you heard their talk earlier in the conference. Basically, it's being increasingly difficult to guarantee the security of systems that are in a virtualized environment, so we've come up with our approach to giving you a way of having, having a virtual machine on, on top of a hypervisor without necessarily having to trust the hypervisor. When we're saying that, we're not saying that hypervisors are bad guys. We're basically saying that our customers are asking, as we try, as we try to move more and more people to cloud computing, especially the, especially the people that we look at, they, they want to use cloud computing, but they don't want to give their stuff to the cloud provider or the cloud provider's administrator or anyone that has access to the cloud system. So our objectives are introduce something we call secure virtual machines. We want to protect the secure virtual machine against attack. We want to protect the confidentiality and integrity of the secure virtual machine. And we're going to integrate with the trusted computing tooling. So what we're doing is dependent on the secure and trusted boot stuff that Nina and et al. talked about earlier in the conference. We in our approach, we enable secrets to be embedded inside of the secure virtual machine. And we, we get secure virtual machines by converting existing virtual machines into secure virtual machines with new tooling that's yet to be open sourced. The, o the whole idea is that instead of having to trust all of the hypervisor, you have to trust your um, host boot, Opal, which were talked about in the secure booting stack. And then we're adding a new piece of code called the protected execution ultravisor, or, or ultravisor for short, and then, and that's it, and the hardware. Um, so we're relying on the open source ecosystem. We're not limiting the amount of protected memory you can put in a machine. And any existing, and, and the way we do this um, has no impact, impact on the applications you run in the virtual machine. And these foils will be on the deck. OK. So this is our quick overview. Um, we got our hardware down at the bottom. We got this protected execution ultravisor on top of it, which is firmware. We have Linux KVM on top of that. And we have both normal virtual machines and secure virtual machines running on top of Linux KVM. As the little red arrows uh, indicate, you can't access the secure virtual machine's memory from a normal virtual machine or from Linux KVM. Um, the system doesn't allow that. Uh, so how is it going to work? So we start with, if you want to create one, oh, well, I should tell you that we still allow the hypervisor to do pretty much everything it normally does for a normal virtual machine, for the secure virtual machine. And I'll talk a bit about how we make that work in a minute, although it may sound familiar. So to create 
a secure virtual machine, you start with a regular virtual machine, you run, you develop your applications, whatever you want to do, while it's a regular virtual machine, and then you run the tooling to convert it into a secure virtual machine. You have to collect the public keys of the authorized machines. We're, one of the things we're introducing in here is every machine will have a public-private key pair. The private key uh, of the machine will remain inside the TPM, and the public key will be available to the owner of the machine. We make it possible for you to have, for you to use the same public key on more than one virtual machine, or to have every machine you own have a different public key. That's your your choice. We do that not by stuff that we've created, but by exploiting the capabilities of the TPM 2.0. Um, our tooling confirms that your file system is encrypted. Um, the the gotcha here is that you'll get only the protections for your encrypted file system that the encryption form that you use allow. We recommend that you use an encrypted file system that gives you integrity protection, of which there is one for Linux, but if you, but you will support any encrypted file system you use. I think in this, in this talk, I probably talk about using dmcrypt, but dmcrypt doesn't have an integrity protection, but there are encrypted file systems that do. Um, and we, the tooling builds some integrity information and outputs an SVM. I'll give you the format of it in just a little bit. It, to let you know what's going on, it starts like any normal VM as a normal virtual machine, nothing special. During the boot process, the SVM executes an inner secure mode syscall instruction, which is a new instruction we inserted into the instruction set. That instruction is executed right at the end of Prominet. The ultravisor receives the SM instruction and it points to some encrypted information and it's included, included with the um, secure virtual machine that enables the ultravisor to check the integrity of the, of the secure virtual machine. Okay, so what does it do? It grabs the entire blob of the secure virtual machine that's in memory at that point and moves it off to secure memory, which cannot be referenced by the hypervisor. Once it gets it to secure memory, it it, it moves the whole thing off, including the secure blob. It, once it gets to secure memory, it, it, it opens up the secure blob, assuming it has permission. It, if it doesn't have permission, it fails right there. Uh, it then opens up the integrity information and checks the integrity of everything that's, that it moved over to make sure that it's the same as it was when the user created the secure virtual machine. If it is the same as it is in, when the user created the secure virtual machine, it shifts the secure virtual machine into secure mode, which I'll explain in a minute, and then it resumes execution and the machine starts to run. Uh, now, I have, um, there's an important point that during execution of the secure virtual machine, the ultravisor receives all interrupts from the SMN it says yes to men and only reflects information required to process the internet. Basically, the ultravisor sits between the secure virtual machine and the hypervisor, and interrupts come into the ultravisor that are intended for the hypervisor, uh, or asynchronous interrupts that would occur while the SVM was running. And what the ultravisor does is it saves off all of the state of the secure virtual machine, which is all the registers, floating point, vector registers, the whole nine yards, puts them into a structure that's in secure memory, and it puts other state into the register state if it's an asynchronous interrupt and reflects the asynchronous interrupt to the hypervisor, um, in our case, Linux KVM. And when the hypervisor is done, it has to call. It, it's, there's a, some patches out, so it'll call back, and we will restart the secure virtual machine. If the interrupt is because of an H call coming out of the SVM intended for the hypervisor to do some work for it, we do exactly the same thing, except we leave into, in the registers reflected to the hypervisor all of the state that the hypervisor needs to do its job. Otherwise, it couldn't do its job, and then it comes back. And then we take this stuff out. Now, uh, we'll get into that. Um, we're going to go now at a, at a slightly lower level and give in more details of that architecture. Okay, so the base principles are the following. Previously in power, we had hypervisor mode, supervisor mode, and problem, problem state. Now we have ultravisor mode, hypervisor mode, supervisor mode, and problem state. Um, ultravisor is at the bottom because it owns the machine. Um, uh, so it's the highest privilege mode in the machine at this point. So this allows us to do these things. Um, we're saying that we're minimizing the trusted 
the trusted base because you only have to trust the stuff below the hypervisor. Um, and with the TPM and stuff, you can find out that this is in fact actually running our stuff and it's a machine and all this other stuff. If you're doing all the remote attestation and you're concerned and you're on a remote cloud provider. Um, we introduced this notion of secure memory, which is only accessible by secure virtual machines and the ultravisor. The other way to say it is it's only, there's a new bit in the MSR, the machine status register that says you're in secure mode and you can only reference something that's in secure me memory if that bit is on. And the only thing that can turn that bit on is the ultravisor. Um, so for those of you who are really into hardware architectures, you realize that the machine therefore has to boot in secure mode with secure mode turned on. So it comes into host boot and Opal if you're familiar with our stack with secure mode on and at the correct point, Opal uh, loads the ultravisor, and when the ultravisor goes back to Opal, um, the secure mode bit is off, and then Opal loads, starts the booting of the, guest, of the guest kernel, just to put it in perspective from what you saw about the secure boot on power. We introduce ultravisor mode, it's, and we enable secure virtual machines. Um, so over, working, here's our overview, and we'll, we'll work through this at, at um, We'll work through this in th a couple of more slides in a little bit more detail. As I told you, at the bottom, we're relying on this uh, TPM where we embed our, our private key. Wherever we get our RAM from, we have the CPU with protected execution facility modifications. We have attached the secure mem memory is a load associated with those modifications. We have normal memory that anybody in the CPU can read, include, including things in running in secure mood. We have new firmware we call the Protected Execution Authorizer. We run um, a Linux KVM hypervisor, and on top of that, we have uh, virtual machines, either secure virtual machines or normal virtual machines. They both come from whatever storage the, the system has, and we, we give you, uh, we create a new tool there where you give the public key so you can convert a machine from one to the other. Um, Protected execution facility refers to the changes made to our open power architecture. And in particular, each machine has a public private key pair. Protected execution ultravisor refers to the uh, open source firmware that will be open source that's not open source yet. You know, I said all of this, so we won't, we won't say it again. All right, so starting from the bottom up. The private key remains in the TPM, actually, you know, there's a function of the TPM for those who are familiar where you can say, give me a public private key pair, keep the private key and give me the public. That's what we use. So the TPM generates the key. Um, the ultravisor does not, for those of you who are familiar with the kernel, the, um, the TPM device driver remain, remains in Linux KVM. And so therefore we're going to have a TSS inside of the ultravisor so that we can appropriately share the device driver with, with the VMs that are running up, up above. However, um, again, exploiting this, the trusted computing base, we can set up a secure channel to the TPM because we have a shared secret and um, we can therefore talk through Linux KVM to the TPM to do the work that we need to do as the ultravisor. So the only thing that you can get is a denial of service attack, you can't get a loss of secrets because the information we're passing back and forth will be in properly encrypted. The hardware separates the memory into normal memory and secure memory and after boot only SVMs and the ultravisors run in secure memory or can reference secure memory. When ESM call is received, if the calling SVM has not been modified and the ultravisor, it, the ultravisor will transition it into secure mode. Um, so. What's going on with the hypervisor is we're slightly more privileged. It has to be para-virtualized to run with the ultravisor. Um, in our research program, in our research pro project, uh, we built a version of this architecture where the ultravisor, where the hypervisor did not have to know that the ultravisor was there. In other words, we virtualized the hypervisor. We did that just for. Why not? It made, we had a small team. It made it easy to do. We didn't have to have hypervisor skills. We got it up and running. We could run virtual machines. And the performance would kick us out of the market <laughs> because it was really bad. I won't give you the numbers unless you really need to know them. We tried it. We did it. We know how to do it. The performance sucks mud. 
And that pushed us into a pair virtualization mo uh, model. And in the model, and the model that we're running now, the impact on normal virtual machines is nearly zero when they're booting. Um, the overhead for secure virtual machines is um, a single digit, and a small single digit. Um, we, we, by our projections, we're, we're still working to get the final numbers on, on the actual hardware. So, um, so if the hypervisor needs to op update the partition scope page table, we'll have to ask the ultravisor. And if it's running an SVM, we'll have to ask the ultravisor to complete the return. If it wants to go back to an SVM, and we're going to update HMM to help manage the secure memory. I think those patches are already pushed out. At the VM level, they run on the same hardware, and we use Grub. We're not, we, we, we built a prototype using Pettyboot, figured out how to use Grub, so we set Pettyboot aside for now. Um, SVM is, SVMs and VMs both get services from the hypervisor, as I indicated earlier. Um, the ultravisor sanitizes everything that goes from the, from the, from the, uh, from the secure virtual machine to the hypervisor. Um, an SVM can share unprotected memory with the hypervisor. It has to. If you couldn't, if you couldn't have what we call normal memory in a secure virtual machine, the secure virtual machine wouldn't be able to communicate with anybody because everything that whenever the hypervisor can look at the secure virtual machine's memory, it only sees it encrypted. So if you're sending a packet off to some other remote system, it's been encrypted by the ultravisor and you don't have the key, so the remote system can't do it. So, so that, that, says, that says that we, in order to get, do IO and things into and out of, a, out of the ultravisor, you've got to do bounce buffering. Um, and you have to bounce buffer through memory that the hypervisor and its subsystem can reference. You do not, um, we do not point the hypervisor at memory and secure mem in the secure memory because it can't reference it. The, when I say it can't reference it, I'll be blunt. The hardware will not allow it. We have changed, we have gone through, we went, went through every single subsystem in the power chip and we looked at them and we analyzed them deeply to determine whether or not they could be made secure by our definition of secure. And every subsystem that, could, that we couldn't make secure in the first round cannot reference secure memory. If it tries, you'll get a machine fault, okay? So you, you have to, to move data from the secure virtual machines to the normal virtual machines, you have to bounce buffer, that's, that's the cost. Um, you know, we create them with new tooling and the secure VM starts executing as a normal VM, as I've said over and over, but it, it, it executes, it's, this ESM instruction is a syscall instruction level three in power. There used to be syscalls level one and two, one, and now we've introduced level three, which goes up to, which goes up to the ultravisor. A revocation. Uh, I, talked about, I talked about this um, at uh, LSS in Vancouver, but I didn't talk about revocation, but it came up in the question, so I'll just talk about it briefly now. Uh, revocation means disabling an SVM from executing on a machine where it, has previous, where it was previously authorized. For all intents and purposes, the SVM is encrypted. Um, I'll get to the format in a minute. Just think of it as an encrypted blob. And the key, obviously not completely encrypted, otherwise it couldn't start as a normal virtual machine, but think of it that way for now. Um, in the case where the SVM is multiply authorized to say, uh, so we, we, I told you you had to have all the public keys. So I can take and build this SVM object and I can embed stuff in this encrypted blob inside of it. And I can embed keys from more than one machine. So that when the SVM starts up, um, the ultravisor has to look in that list and it's fairly quick to say, well, is, is my, is my, which one of these am I supposed to be able to decrypt? And if it doesn't see its identity in there, it fails. If it sees its identity in there, it, it uses the TPM to decrypt that blob, looks at the results, and then proceeds on with the execution. So if you're revoking, you're saying, well, do I want to revoke it on every machine that I've authorized it for, or do I want to revoke it on a single machine? So those are the two questions that we're sort of looking at and thinking about. Um, who's, but who is revoking the access? Well, there's really three, three choices. There's the user of the SVM, the creator of the SVM, or the owner of the infrastructure. Those are like the three primary parties who would want some revocation. And should, it be, should revocation be reversible? All right. For users, 
a user doesn't, nobody's forcing a user to use an SVM. If, if they happen to have one they, and they don't want it anymore, they can just erase it. It's that simple. That's a complete revocation. It's not reversible, but it works. The creator of the SVM, he, we have a model that exists today in software called the license server model that gives the creator of the SVM the ability to grant and, grant and remove licenses on an SVM and to even have a revocable. If I revoke your license because you didn't pay me my fee and you pay the fee, then I can reinstate it. If you, if you write your SVM, and you can do this because the SVM is essentially encrypted, so you can embed in secrets and set up your, and, go, and, and call home or call wherever and, and say, am I still authorized to run? And if you're authorized to run, you'll run. And if you're not authorized to run, you won't run. And, and we have integrity protection on our stuff. So if somebody starts twirling bits trying to break it, it won't run anyway. So, so that revocation is handled. What's not handled gracefully <laughs> and what we've done is enabling the infrastructure owner to decide, I don't want that SVM to run because he can kill it, but he kills them all because he changes his public-private key set and that, that gets rid of all of them. Uh, we realize that's, that's fairly heavy-handed, so we're looking at various alternatives, all of which will invo involve some form of a revocation list and therefore will probably not be reversible, depending on which way we go. If you have comments or questions on that, we can talk about it later. Limits. In the first release, will not support suspend and resume and migration. Um, that's to make it easier to get the first release out. Um, and we'll also not commit, support overcommit of SVM memory in the first release. Our architecture and our design allows the hypervisor to page SVM memory. We're just deferring that till we get it, till we get it running. Then we'll, then we'll put that in. Um, and we will not in the first release support dedicated devices to SVMs. Uh, that, that, that's because in, in the time frame in which we had to design the hardware, we couldn't figure out how to make it work well, so we said, nope. So you can't dedicate a device to a virtual machine. What can you do? You can do all the virtual I.O. you want to. We have the Vert I.O. subsystem for virtual machines. It works well, and, and we're modifying it to the bounce buffering, so that's a modification to the kernel, and all the Vert I.O. devices will be supported. Okay. Uh, we understand that that's a limitation that may not be acceptable to some customers, and in future releases, those are things that we will consider and address. It does not support transaction memory uh, currently. So an application, if it uses transaction memory and it runs in an SVM, it will crash. All right. Uh, a few more lower level details. All right. Here's our contents of the ESM blob. In this case, I've illustrated this particular one is encrypted for three different machines, A, B, and C. And there's the symmetric key that decrypts this blue thing uh, wrapped under, that's been encrypted with the public key of each of those machines. The uh, verification information con contains integrity information for the kernel, the initram FS, and RTAS. Uh, it may contain some symmetric key blobs, and it, may, and it does contain the passphrase for the encrypted file system. Remember I said that your, your main disk is encrypted. Is we, our tooling makes sure you've encrypted it one way. If you haven't encrypted it, we'll encrypt it with whatever we decide is the default encryption method and stick the passphrase in there. This passphrase is uh, stuck in this blob and is inside of the ultravisor net. Uh, one of the mods we have to make to the kernel is you've got to use an ultra call to get the passphrase so that you can mount your disk and see the contents. <laughs> Otherwise, you can do whatever you want with it, but it'll all be encrypted. So, um, so since it's locked up in here, you can't, as the, this came up in uh, the, the KVM forum, which is concurrent with this one, you can't as KVM play around with the SVM and then, and then emulate it because as KVM, you won't be running in secure mode and you won't be able to get the, 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 the passphrase for the disk out of, out of this blob that's associated with the secure virtual machine. So how do we boot? Uh, this, pic this picture refers to booting, um, uh, uh, let's see, booting a virtual machine on top of Linux KVM. Soft is not part of our design. It's what people normally use. Oh, oh wait. Yes. 
So what happens is sloth eventually passes control of the grub, which is in the prep partition. It is not encrypted. That's why we can start unencrypted. It goes and it, and it, and it goes and eventually it does, okay, which one of these kernels do I want to boot? It does its thing. You, can, you could, in an SVM, have multiple kernels that you wanted to boot. You don't have to have just one. You know, we, we sort of, when we had design choices, we erred on the side of, on the side of flexibility in this, in this case. So you could have just one. You could have more than one. In any case, they'll all be Z images. Um, Grub boots a Z image just fine. So you'll get your Grub men menu. You'll have your default. If you want to, you'll have however much time you've allowed yourself to switch to a different one if you want to. Inside of that Z image is, is the blob. So you start, you start booting that. You, and that gives you a, slight, a slash boot file system, which is unencrypted. But we have some integrity information on the things that we need to know about that we'll check. And then, uh, you'll, and then you have the real root file system, which is encrypted. And I've explained how we, you know, what we do there. So we start as a normal virtual machine. At the end of Prominet, we say, Give me, get me, switch me to secure mode. You get copied into secure memory. We search for the properly wrapped symmetric key. After we copy you into secure memory, if it's not found, execution fails. If it's found, we decrypt the verification information. If decryption fails, if decryption, if decryption fails, verification fails. Using the verification information to confirm the integrity information of the kernel, the initRAMFS, and the RTES information. If that, if, if, when that is successful, if all that, if the integrity, integrity means if the bits have not been modified, then we, we pass control to the SVM in secure mode and the pass, fail, pass phase is available through the ultra call. The um, ESM ultra call is the only one you can make from a normal, normal virtual machine. You know, it makes it easier. And we have some ultra calls for the hypervisor and we check to make sure that if you're coming into the ultravisor, you're coming in from the right location. All right, so we're going to make this open source. So uh, we've already, in each case, I'm wa walking through the things that we, that we think we're going to have to change in order to make this work. We had to change prominent around so that this notion of letting you run through prominent unencrypted uh, works as long as prominent doesn't make changes that would cause the, inte the integrity verification to fail. Originally it did. These patches changed that. So it doesn't do that any longer. So we can do that. Um, there's a wrapper. Um, and so we, we, so we've made some changes to l let the ESM stuff, the ESM blob be added to the Z, Z image. That, that changes up. We're probably going to have to make some form of a change to Grub. We're, we're debate, not to Grub, the core of Grub, but to either some of the scripts or some of the things around it. Those changes have not been pushed up, but they will be shortly. Um, I've, um, this is a summary of, of what we call our, of the ESM calls available from the SVM to the um, ultravisor uh, or from the hypervisor to the ultravisor. Um, SCOM, read and write SCOM. Um, SCOM is, SCOM registers are the registers in the power architecture that the hypervisor and other entities use to control the configuration of the hardware. The entire machine can be reconfigured and f not the entire machine, but a good part of the machine can be reconfigured using the SCOM registers. And for those of you who are hardware, you realize this means you could bypass almost any security feature you wanted to which is why you can't write a SCOM register without the ultravisor look at, looking at it and said, do I like this? If I, if I think it's OK, it goes. And if I don't, you get told you were successful. But it doesn't happen. It's, you know, we just, anything that we don't like about your SCOM request will be blocked out without telling you. I guess we, we're concerned about security. Um, so we can you can pick up you can page in and page out you can write you can write the partition table you uv return is the call that the hypervisor uses to tell the ultravisor i want to start this secure virtual machine we had 
We were originally going to not let the hypervisor know that the machine was a secure virtual machine or not. We decided to change that since it, we didn't think it could really hurt it, so we make it explicit. Uh, registering and unregistering mem memory slots is about getting and sharing memory. Um, we can, you can terminate us, us uh, SVM terminate, I think is coming out of the SVM. Uh, share and unshare, oh, sorry. Well, we got, we've got, uh, for, in power we have something called VPA and then, and a couple of other things that we have to share with the hypervisor. The shared pages is the share page and unshared page. The memory slots are the other things. And we have the ESM. We also have some things so that secure virtual machines can share memory across from each other, but they're not on this list right now. For KVM, um, there's some special H calls we needed. We needed um, start it, finish it, terminate it, page in, page out. And then uh, TPM com is just, uh, we need to add this H call so the ultravisor re will reflect TPM com to the hypervisor when it needs to talk to the TPM and the response will come back to the ultravisor. The ultravisor reflects it to the hypervisor as if it's coming from the SVM, but it's really the ultravisor that's doing it. Um, we have to modify HMM we're you, because we want to use HMM. We don't want to write a bunch of code. We're trying to expo exploit much of what of Linux is out there right now. So we've got a, a, a proposed set there that will allow HMM to manage moving memory between things between secure and insecure. Of course, the ultravisor will get in, the mem get in and encrypt or decrypt as necessary as those things happen. Oh, I got vert.io here. We have a set of initial patches out for vert.io. Um, this is a set that was designed, but we're debating a simpler set of patches for vert.io that, rel that rely on the DMA ops and the DMA ops structure that's in the vert.io that might be simpler than the ones that are out there. And we're working with the vert.io maintainer to um, zero in on exactly the set of patches. Uh, the th sorts of things that we've been modifying and looking at modifying are similar to the things that A and B's been looking at modifying. Um, and then we're talking, we have a set of changes out for VPA, which is a power specific thing. Let's see. Now, just to get a little more into the hardware, um, this gives you the point. This is what we changed um, at a high level. Uh, we added an address bit that indicates the memory is secure or not secure. It's a high order address bit, um, much higher than any machines that we have will exist for a while. We added an MSRS bit that, ren that indicates the process is running secure. We added, um, we now, because we have that, we now have these are your, these are your, what state you're in if you're in secure mode. These are what state you're in if you're not secure. And we have one that's reserved um, for future capabilities that we're looking at. We added a bunch of new registers like SMFCTRL, which tells the system whether SMF is enabled. The hardware is designed so it comes up with SMF enabled if it gets, if SMF gets disabled, it cannot be re-enabled without rebooting the machine. Once it's turned off, it's off for the duration. We added a bunch of ultravisor specific registers, URMOR, URS, USSR, USRR 0 and 1, USPRG 0 and 1, which are similar to the special registers that we make available for hypervisors on power. We added a, a new instruction, URFID, which on, the ultravisor can use, which allows it to return to something and flip on the SBIT, a convenient feature. And Okay, so, and, and these other things that I, I mentioned earlier, all the hypercalls go to the ultravisor, all the interrupts go to the ultravisor when you're in secure mode, and we reflect stuff to the hypervisor. So here's our quick summary. Um, we protect you from the hypervisor, other software system admins. The security domain is the VM at rest in transit or executing. We don't change the applications that run in the SVM. We have some new K-config op operations. KVM must be pair virtualized. Those patches are being put together. We secure memory has integrity and confidentiality protection. We and you can embed secrets. We're limited by the available memory, and it all will be open source. In the there's a bunch of links to papers and things that are rela related to this. And do you have any questions? Questions. What reference slide? Okay, so one one of the things that 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 
that we have in STX is the, is, is the ability for, for Enclave to prove that it runs inside secure Enclave and not inside emulated environment. Is there such thing in this, this system? Well, you... you so, so, that, so that if you, are, if you have an Enclave running on a yeah, cloud... Yeah, I know, you, I know you, what you're you, talking you, about. Basically, yeah. what we're going to do is be exploiting the, t the TPM for that so that you can know that you're actually talking to a system that has a real TPM that was on an IBM platform and, and, the, and, the, and, and then you can use that, you can use the remote attestation for that feature. Right. It's similar to the attestation that you have in the Enclave because what you've done is you, you've, you've put in an attestation capability so the Enclave can attest right, to the right, user. Right, right, right. We're can, just going to exploit the attestation yeah, from the TPM. Yeah, you can, you can it's, it's, it's actually equivalent to a, to a hardware chip in, in a way. Yeah, yeah so correct. we're just exploiting the attestation in the TPM. Question. You're saying that everything will be open source. Does it mean Ultravisor also? Does it mean what? Ultravisor also? Ultravisor will be open source. Okay, great. Uh, could you please, uh, Mikola Mandra in CR, could you please uh, tell if there are any key differences from ARM monitor for Ultravisor? From what? ARM monitor. ARM monitor? ARM monitor. Yes. I'm not that familiar with ARM monitor, so right. let's yes. take that question offline. So does power system have protection against somebody installing something to the random access memory bus? Is the, is the secondary memory encrypted? Is there protection against hardware tampering? Okay, so we do not have a hardware encryption on our memory right now. It is uh, fairly difficult to uh, tamper with the hardware memory, but that's something that will be coming, but it won't be in the first release. And, and it um, probably when we, for power and open power, when we do hardware encryption, it's gonna be sort of like what you see in Z-Series. Um, if you're familiar with that, we now have this per pervasive encryption in Z-Series. So the encryption of the memory that protects the encrypted memory will be orthogonal. The hardware part of that encryption will be orthogonal, and the Ultravisor will still have its own independent encryption. Okay. Uh, Monty Wiseman, Gen General Electric. Um, you mentioned that um, the VMs are gonna have, are gonna have a tunnel down to the physical DPM. So they're gonna be sharing the same physical TPM? Is that the proposal? The, we, don't, we don't in our, no, we don't have the VM share the physical TPM. The ultravisor has access to the physical TPM as the hypervisor has access to the physical TPM. The, the operating system that boots on the hardware has a device driver for the physical TPM. And it has a TSS in it that allows the virtual machines above it to share access. So I guess if, there, if the virtual machine is written to access the physical TPM, yes, we'll all be using the same one. So then kind of but, but we're not bypassing, there's only one device driver in the entire system. We're not putting another one in. So, so kind of get to where Yurko's going then. How, I mean, the, the TPM's key hierarchy works very well for virtualization and sharing but the PCRs do not. So how are you able, if you have these multiple VMs, how are you able, how are you gonna be able to attest to launching each one of these VMs and be able to attest what operating system launched and then kind of a follow up to that. If they turn on IMA, how do they all share the same, if they're all sharing the same physical TPM, well, how would the, they do that? Seems so, like you have to go to a VTPM. Okay, I'm not sure I've got all of your question. The Ultravisor actually won't, the Ultravisor gets booted as part of, it's part of the firmware. And it actually won't start if the PCRs are not in the, in the correct state, all right? So if, if the PCRs are not in the correct state, in other words, you're trying to boot something else, the secret for that machine is locked permanently. Um, that's, that's the only other thing we need the, um, the, the, TPM, the Ultravisor needs to TPM for is using the, the private key to 
decrypt things. That's it. We don't ever reference any other PCRs or anything. So as we're coming up, we have a fairly fancy policy that allows us to set a password for access to the private key. And so once on the boot of every SVM, the altervisor uses that password is created when the firmware is booting up before you get to uh, the boot of the base operating system. And when that, as part of creating that password, the T P P PCRs that it's based on are extended to so nobody else can do it. Um, and then the ultravisor has that password, and then every time it wants to start an SVM, it asks the TPM to decrypt this blob and hand it back and then keep going. So we're not, we don't care about the PCRs or anything else after that. That's all we use it for. We use it for holding our secret and decryption, and that's it. So they have, okay, so you really do have VTPMs for individual. Yeah, individual. we, we okay, the, v, right. the VTPM is up in KVM. We don't. Oh, I see. Okay, we don't. Good. We don't. We're not taking that away. We're not using right. the VTM. So each we're not. VM has its own VTPM. Every, every and VM, VTPM, including SVMs, would have individual. their own VTPM. Okay. Exactly. But I think that probably addresses Yarko's question as well. Okay. But I think we have to, if there are more questions, maybe there is a break right now so you can come talk to speaker. So let's thank the speaker. Thank